And I'm not even sure that she knows how many of my life events she's walked through with me in the time we've known each other over these years. Um, just so much of um, happiness and grief and joy and just as I was growing, she's always right there and always steady, just always the Jill that she is. And so I'm grateful for you for that in my life. Um, I'm also great for my, grateful for my husband, Reverend Thomas Patrick O'Connor, who came later in life for me, but uh, was in, has always been there since I've needed him. And I think the thing I love, it's probably not the thing I love most, but one of the things I love about him, is that he doesn't have hang-ups about women in ministry and women who are called. So he's always right by my side when I'm ministering and otherwise as I am by his too. So I'm grateful to you, honey. I'm grateful to you. All for being here with your hearts open and your ears open today um, and accepting me to come and share with you what I'm learning from the Lord. I'm grateful to God for this weighty call that He's given me. I'm usually mostly afraid of it, but I'm also <laughs> grateful because He's given us all um, the work to do in Him, and this one just happens to be mine. So thank you. I spent some time preparing a, a particular type of sermon that I learned how to prepare and that I think I think when you're called to preach and sermonize and teach and all those things, it's important to know different styles to do it so that people can receive wherever they are. There's a phrase that we say, when in Rome, to is Roman, and that's something that I kind of like to follow, and so I like to meet people wherever they are, as I like for people to meet me where I am. But we learned a particular way to put together a sermon um, and I spent the past three or four weeks working through that, working through it in my head and trying to come up with my three points or my six points or my four points or whatever that was going to be. And as the Lord often does me through the Holy Spirit, uh, he changed all of that around <laughs> last night. So, <laughs> so yeah, I spent the whole day working on it. And then last night, I, I think I ran into the living room where my husband was and I was like, let me ask you a question. And that just changed everything. And so what I have for you today is actually not a sermon uh, proper, it's a message. And so I came with a message of hope and of encouragement. It may not sound like that as we kind of get into it, but by the end, I hope that we all arrive somewhere where we feel a little bit stronger, a little bit more encouraged, um, and a little bit more ready to move forward in the Lord. So now I'm going to put my extra eyes on, and we're going to get into this. So, in life, <laughs> in life, I found, and I'm sure that you have too, that when we know something, when we understand something, we're better prepared to handle it. Um, sometimes we get, we have a medical issue or symptoms, and we don't know what it is, but once we get that diagnosis, even if it's bad, even if it's detrimental, we can make a plan. We can gather ourselves and move forward decide on treatment, figure out who to call, what resources we need to use, who can walk through it with us, and how to go to God about it once we know what we're dealing with. Sometimes there's bad news, and people will tell us, I, if you, are you sitting down? I hope you're sitting down. And we find ourselves saying, just tell me. Like that moment of, I hope you're sitting down, just raises too much anxiety in a lot of us, and we just want to hear the news so we can deal with it and move forward. And there are some people, like, like Thomas, he didn't like surprises. It's not good to try to throw him a surprise birthday party. Surprises just cause him too much anxiety. Like, just, if we're going to have a party, say we're going to have a party, and I'll be ready for the party. Mm -hmm. So I think for many of us, when we don't know something and we don't understand something, it's really hard to navigate and to move forward in life. And so I think we find out when we know, when we understand, we can make a plan. Our plans aren't always the best plans. Sometimes they're not even the plans that God has for us, but eventually we get back on that track and we're able to move forward. And so this is where we find ourselves today. If we think about the condition of the world that we're in, the time that we're living in right now, we are in a time where we might be tempted, I've said it and I've heard it said, to, to not understand what's going on. To say things like, I don't know what the world is coming to. I don't know what's happening in the world. This has never happened before. I've never seen something like this happen. And all sorts of things that we feel confused and the world, the media feels confused. But I wonder if that's the right narrative for believing people, for the people of God. 
I wonder if we're caught up in the world's confusion, in secular confusion, but as a community of God, I wonder if we don't actually know exactly what's going on. And so what I'm going to talk with us a little bit about today, sharing with myself and sharing with you as well, is recognizing and responding to the spirit of the enemy in this world. Because when we recognize it, we have a response in the word of God. We have hundreds of responses. And I'm just going to pull out one today and give us some tools that should help us go from here, feeling like we can uh, be encouraged, that we can take courage, that we can gird ourselves, and we can stand through anything and everything that's going on. So let's think for a second just about the spirit of the enemy. On this picture that's up here, that's the earth. And so we're there. We're all in our little place there on the earth. And then do you see that kind of aura around it, that kind of light space? The Bible tells us that the enemy, the adversary, Satan, who was once the morning star, the day star, an anointed cherub with God and the heavenly host, did what he did and was cast to earth and no longer carries that title. His title now is Satan, the adversary, the enemy. And you can read and study about what happened with that and how the spirit of uh, uh, the enemy entered the world. You'll find that in the Old Testament and Ezekiel uh, and maybe a little bit in Isaiah. But if we look at that kind of aura that's around the earth, we can think about that's a little bit of an emotional word picture of where the enemy is operating. Because the Bible tells us in Ephesians that, the, that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And what that means is that for a time, he has some dominion to do things. He's roaring to and fro. He's walking around minding all of our business, and which is actually his business. He has some dominion. And he's able, together with his henchmen, his demons, his imps, his cohorts, his co-conspirators, I have many names for them because I call them out often when they're minding our business, they're able to cause some things to happen, to be involved in some things that are happening, and to try to continue to put us off of the path and the sideline of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the leader of our community. And so in that aura, in that area, all sorts of stuff is going on, and we are the recipients of that on earth. Crime happens. Mental illness is at an all-time high. Murder, death, cancer seems to have gone nuts, and it's just attacking even the people of God. It all feels new. And we're in a pandemic. We are living through something that we've often said, this has never happened before. Even though you no, know, it happened about 100 years ago, I wasn't here, it wasn't anybody else. <laughs> and that other thing didn't happen. And I'm sure I know from biblical history as well as secular history, pandemics have happened before. So think about the plagues in the New Testament. Those definitely were things that impacted, if not a whole community, town, area, a whole nation. So pandemics have happened before. There's nothing new under the sun. Murder and crime and pillaging. All goes by different names with different generations, but it's all been here since that evil entered the world because it is the spirit of the enemy who is the prince of the power of the air. So anything horrible, anything detrimental, anything terrifying, anything that is going on in our world today is because of the prince of the power of the air. And we know that because we have our biblical proof of that. We can see it happen again and again and again. And when we study, we recognize it. And so we can recognize that pandemics and bad diagnoses and death and murder and losing our loved ones and crime that happens in our communities and outside of our communities and um, rain and rule that isn't godly. All of those things, all of the leadership that isn't godly happens because this, this is the time of the enemy, of the adversary of God. And any enemy of God is an enemy of ours because we are his community. We are his believers. We are brothers and sisters with Christ, participating with Christ in the redemption of the world, of nations, not just me, not just my four and no more, not just certain people that we believe are worthy, but the world. That's what the Bible tells us. So we have a job. Once we received Christ, Everyone has a work to do. Everyone has a job to do. 
for Christ in you, in the community, minus this and some other things. Yours may be different. It may be close. It may be the same. But we all have a work to do for Christ. So it's important that we recognize and we respond to the spirit of man in the world. And so now our narrative changes. We don't need to say, I don't understand what's going on. I've never seen this before. The world is going crazy. Like that's not, that's the world's narrative. Our narrative is I recognize the spirit of Jamie. I see you, Satan, and I'm going to stand against you. So let's go to first and excuse my allergies. I'm not crying. I'm not crying. So I'm not crying. I just have really bad morning allergies. So excuse me for that. Let's go to the book of Nehemiah, if we can, please. We're going to read a little bit in chapter six. As I said, the Bible has hundreds of responses to the spirit of the enemy in this world. This is just one, but this is one that I love. I'm a fan of Nehemiah, and I preach Nehemiah often because Nehemiah was what I call a soldier. He did not back down. He did not get worried and concerned about what the prince of the power of the air was doing. He always stayed about the Lord's business, and I appreciate him for that. So if you will go with me into Nehemiah, we're going to start cha uh, in chapter 6. We're going to read in chapter 6. I'll start at verse 1, and we're going to read all the way through verse 3. Just for your information, I'm using my Amplified version. I just do that because I like the extras that it gives us when we're understanding of it. Okay. So Nehemiah 6 and 1 begins, Now, when Sambalit, Tobiah, Gishon the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, and that there was no breach left in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors in the gate, Sanballat and Gisham sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Mona. But they intended to do me harm. And just as a pause right there, as a community of God, when we are believers and we are full of the Spirit of God, we recognize the enemy. Nehemiah understood that they were not calling him for good, to reason with him. They were calling him to reason with the enemy. Come and cohort with me, the enemy, and let me see if I can stop this work of the Lord that was going on. What was happening at this time, before we read further, is that Nehemiah had influenced all the people of, of Jerusalem, of the city, to come and rebuild the wall, to fortify the city against outsiders. Ezra, previous to Nehemiah, had tried to do some work with that, but it wasn't his call, it wasn't his time. And God called Nehemiah touched his heart with compassion for his city and for his people. And Nehemiah was able to influence regular people, just like me and you who live there, to come and reconstruct this wall. Not only that, but they did it with their own tools. There were no special things brought in. Nobody sponsored them with tools. Nehemiah called to the people, bring what you have. Bring what's in your storage shed. What's in your garage? What's in your kitchen cabinet? What's in the junk drawer? In your house, all those places that we have. People just brought what they had, and they were unified together, and they were working on the wall. And at this time, it was almost done. He just hadn't hung the doors and done some finishing. But the people had worked all the time against the scourge of the enemy, the adversary. In, in this case, it was the adversary was clear and acting through um, Sambala and um, some other people who were with him. These were people in leadership. These are people who had influence over the people and had authority and charge over the people, and they were doing the best they could to stop the work of the Lord from going forward. Nehemiah recognized it, as we should, when the enemy is working in our communities, in our towns, in our homes, in our families, in our networks, in our nation, we need to recognize it like Nehemiah did, and then make the choice to respond in the way that he did. And here was his response. <clears throat> After he said that they intended to do me harm, he said, and I sent a messenger to them. He didn't go himself. He sent a messenger saying, I'm doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave to come down to you? That's our response. Why would I stop working for the Lord to come and reason with the enemy? I'm not doing that. I'm not coming down. I'm not coming to talk to you myself. I'm not going to text you. I'm not going to return your email. I'm not going to vote that particular vote that speaks to that thing. I'm going to stay focused 
on the work that God called me to do. Amen. What is your work in the community as we're building this cooperative wall with Jesus for the redemption of the world? Your response should be to stay on the wall. And Nehemiah showed us just how to do that. I, he didn't even respond personally. He sent a messenger and said, why, should, why would I come down and talk to you? You're the enemy, and I'm not going to conspire with you. So that's our response as believing people. And so once we had our response to that, and we set our faces like Flint, and we said, I'm going to stay on the job that God sent me to do. I am not going to turn left or right, and I'm not going to reason with the enemy. Then what do we do? Because standing can be difficult. What tools do we use to stay on the wall? How do we keep our own uh, uh, spirits up? How do we keep ourselves moving forward? Well, our Bible has an answer for that as well. So we will go from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and we will witness to what Nehemiah did in the book of Ephesians. And this is the last time I'm going to go a little we're going to go to Ephesians and read quite a bit in chapter 6. So if you will go to chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 10. This was written by beloved Paul, who did a lot of instruction and a lot of writing and encouraging people while he himself was uh, under the power of the prince of the air. So during this time, Paul was in prison in Rome, so he wasn't even free to go out and do the work, but he was writing letters and encouraging people to do the work. And so we're going to look at tools that Paul gave us, and we're going to start at verse 10, and I'm going to read all the way to 19, so hang in here with me. Again, I'm using my amplified, so there'll be a little bit of amplification for what we're reading. Ephesians 6, verse 10, starts with, in conclusion, and I should say that Paul had given a lot of instruction Prior to this, one through nine, he talked to children about what they should do. He talked to servants about how they should obey their masters. He talked to masters about how they should treat their servants. So he had just given a bunch of instruction, and now he was rounding them out. He was giving it, although it took him a minute to get to the end. So he said, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord. That means be empowered through your union with Christ. Draw your strength from him, the strength which his boundless might provides. Put on God's whole armor that you may be able, that you may be able successfully to stand up against all the strategies and the deceits of the devil. For we are not wrestling with flesh and blood. That means we're not contending only with physical opponents, people who are here in our presence, but we're wrestling against despotisms, against the powers. Remember that prince of the power of the air? Against the master spirits who are in the world rulers of this present storminess against the spirit force of wickedness in heavenly, supernatural places above us, over us, in spheres that we can't see, but we're touched by. We can definitely feel them, and in Christ we can recognize them. In 13, he goes on to say, therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all that your crisis demands to stand firmly in your place, stand therefore. Hold your ground. Having tightened the belt of truth around your loins, and having put on the breastplate of integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing with God, and having shod your feet in the preparation to face the enemy with the firm foot of stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Lift up over all the covering, the shield of saving faith, upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the Spirit wields, which is the word of God. Pray at all times, on every occasion, in every season, in the Spirit, with all manner of prayer and entreaty. <coughs> to that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. And pray also for me that freedom of utterance may be given me 
that I may open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news, which is the gospel. Well, what about that? That is a toolbox full of everything we need to withstand what is being, uh, uh, what we are being, uh, I lost my train of thought, what's happening to us, I lost the word, what's happening to us because of the spirit, of the print, of the power of the air. So there are seven things here that we're going to walk back through. This is the whole armor of God. We hear that a lot when we talk about the helmet and the breastplate and the sword and the shield and the, the sandals of our feet being shot. All of that is exactly what we need, but there are seven particular tools that we need to do as we are putting on our armor and marching in. We need to do seven things. And so I'm going to call those out for you. The first one is that 10, and it says, be strong in the Lord. So we have to have confidence that we have a relationship with Christ. We have received him into our hearts and our lives as our Savior, and he empowers us to stand. So we need to be strong in the Lord, and then we need to put on our whole armor. Because once we receive him, we get that armor as a gift for, from him, among many other gifts. The Holy Spirit, all sorts of things. But he gives us this whole armor of God once we receive him. And then down in verse 13, it tells us that having done all to stand, is what the New King James Version would say. This version says, having done all that the crisis demands, that happens when we find out what's going on, we hear the bad news, we get the diagnosis, we see what's happening in the world, whatever that is, then we need to have a response. What is the crisis demanding? Do I need to call for some help? Do I need to get some resources? Do I need to go get some counseling? Whatever the crisis is demanding, do I need to move? Do I need to make a doctor's appointment? We need to do that. So this is this is Paul reminding us, don't just be passive about what's happening. Just, oh, Lord, I just need you right now. Just come in any way you can. We have work to do, too. So having done all that the crisis demands, make your moves in the Lord and do all of that. And then stand in confidence once you've done that. Having done all to stand, stand firm in your place. That's that stay on the wall. I'm not coming down. Then we go down to verse 14 tells us to stand therefore, hold our ground, and then start to gird ourselves. Put on the belt. Put on the breastplate. Hold up the shield that covers everything. Down 18 tells us that we need to pray at all times. On every occasion. In every season. We have to always have a little um, a little prayer wheel turning in my heart, always. Sometimes around, and I, I got this, I'm from a, a Christian tradition, a tradition in Pentecostal church. I have strong patriarchs that as I was growing up, I read and I joke about this with my husband, I would be like, good Lord, Granny just prays not to me. Like, does she always have to pray all day? <laughs> Every day, you know, 24 hours, 4.30 in the morning, we could hear my grandmother around the kitchen praying. My mother did the same thing. I would be so annoyed, like putting the pillow on. I said, you don't need to just always talk to her every second of the day. Now, though, at age three, I get that. And sometimes my husband will tell me, uh, because we live in close quarters, he'll say, you were just saying something, or you were just praying, and I don't even really necessarily recognize it. It's just in my heart. It's in my spirit. And I keep that going. And this is what this is telling us to do. Always pray on every occasion, everything that's happening. Talk to our brother, Christ Jesus, about it and get some direction. The next thing it does, verse 18, uh, says to keep alert and watch. I think there's a fact to say that says watch and pray. So we have to know what's going on. So as God's people, we can't hide our heads in the sand. I hear it all the time. I don't watch this. I don't listen to, I listen to one person. Now, I just listen to Charles Stanley or whoever that might be. No offense to Dr. Stanley, I love it. But we have to watch. We have to know. How do you know what to pray for if you don't know what's going on? How do you know what the enemy is doing in this realm, this atmosphere, if you don't watch, if you're not careful? And don't hear me wrong. That's not to say that we need to run from network to network and outlet to outlet and believe everything everybody says. But you need to be aware of what's happening because the world is depending on us to pray. It doesn't know it, but we're its only hope because Christ is its only hope. Amen. 
And we are a connection to Christ. The Bible tells us which prayers God hears. He doesn't hear the prayers of the sinners. So we have to be praying for them, for it, for our world, for everything that's going on. And we have to know what's happening in order to know what to pray for. Just on that note, when things are going on in our family, I have a group of, um, of sisters. They're, we're all God's sisters because we grew up together in the same church, the same church tradition. We just know each other all our lives. And sometimes we need to call on one another for corporate prayer. And when I do that, one of the things I learned is that I give direction for the types of prayers that we need. I don't just say, oh, pray for us. It's terrible. I'll say, here's what we're dealing with, as much as I can disclose. And I'll say, here's what I'd like you to pray for, that God will give us direction, or God will open up this way, or whatever it is that we're praying for, that he will be healed, or I will be healed. Because we'll find that people who aren't aware of what's going on, again, that's that knowing, will pray stuff that could be not only not in line with what you're searching for, or what you're looking for, but maybe not even aligned with the will of God. They may have good intentions, but if I pray that we move out of state and I ask you to pray and you're praying that God crowns us right here, we're not in agreement. So you need to know what we need from the Lord. And so um, this part says keep alert and watch so you know what you're praying for and what you're asking people to pray for. And that final one, which is, is fine, it's seven, but it's not the least important. It says, um, uh, keep alert, watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding on behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. That's us. So if we're not praying for one another, praying that churches rise up and start once again to attract people to come, praying that pastors be held firm in their faith and they don't fall for the snares and the tricks of the enemy, praying that lay people will put their hands to the work and to the gospel plow of Jesus Christ, and we're only praying for ourselves, we're isolating the body of God. We are one people, one body, with many different uh, limbs, many different ways that we need to work. But we need to be praying, interceding for one another. That's not just not like, Lord, you know, my friend Jill, I just love her so much. Thank you for her. That's Lord, whatever is going on in Jill's life, even at this very moment, I may not know about it, but you do. Send the Holy Spirit, God deal with that thing that's going on in her, Father God, and deliver from whatever it is. Bless them mightily. Because together, we're a unit. If it's just me and I'm only praying for me, what kind of price? So we have, kind of just to round them off, we have a response to what's going on in our world. And I want you to take courage, gird yourselves, and stand. We recognize the spirit of the enemy. It may look different, it may come different, but that's all that's happening, is that the enemy is having his dominion right now. He's doing everything he can to make us do what Job's wife wanted him to do, which is curse God and die. Right? And not the first death, but we all have to do that anyway. That eternal death. His goal is to keep us from our eternal life in the new heaven and the new earth with the Lord as reign, and for us to end up where he's going to end up. That's his only goal. And so we have to resist that. Be encouraged, gird ourselves up with the tools that God gave us and stay right through the pandemic, right through the next thing that's coming, right through political unrest, right through civil unrest, right through all of the illnesses that are seem to be overtaking our world, right through crime, right through race uh, uh, increases in mental illness, Right through schools, being in the trouble that they're in. Everything that is horrible that can happen seems like it's happening. But we have a response. We're not coming down off the wall to reason with the enemy. And we have tools to use. The whole armor, our prayer, and our ability to stand. And finally, I just want to read that last verse one more time. In Ephesians 6 and 19, because this is what I beseech for you. These are Paul's words. And he was pouring himself on the mercy of the people he was writing to because he knew he needed to be Verse 19 says, and pray also for me. And I'm asking that of you. The freedom of utterance may be given me, that I may open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mystery of the good news, the gospel. And that's it. If you'll just bow with me so we can just put a final prayer on this. My Father God, how I thank you for being among your people today. 
Thank you for the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Thank you that they're acceptable in your sight. Thank you for the open ears and the open hearts. And I pray, God, that you bless these your people in your house of worship today. God, we can be anywhere, but we're here. I pray a special blessing over this house, over the members, over the leaders, over those who will come who have not yet found this to be their church home. I pray that you bless God and you increase and you enhance all the more, all the wonderful work that they're doing in this community. I thank you for fellowship and I thank you for the spirit of God that has dominion over the spirit of the enemy. In Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord.